right. So I'll be presenting on chapter three and four. Chapter three is on system setup. So just getting your computer ready to start making packages. And chapter four is about package structure and the different states that a package could be in. So in order to prepare your system, make sure you have the latest R and R Studio version available. And you can click on that link to get the latest. And make sure you've downloaded the following packages. In the book, they didn't include use this, but I did because <laughs> I needed it from the get-go. Um, really great package to get you up and running. And they also recommend um, that you check out the preview version of our studio for some features that are not yet released uh, in the released version. And they say these features are more stable than the daily build. Um, I, I have not worked with this version. If anyone has, let me know if there's any cool features that I might have been missing out on. Okay, so DevTools is one of the most important packages that we need. Indeed, it's one of the ones that we need to download to, to start. And a little bit of history here. It has grown into quite a huge package, so much so that it became inconvenient to have everything in one place uh, in terms of maintaining it. So they've decided to split a lot of functionality that's in DevTools into seven smaller packages. And their advice is if your package depends on DevTools, meaning it calls upon it to do something, then it is better to access the functions through one of those smaller seven packages. That's what I understood by what they said about that. And for all the other uses, which they call interactive uses, as opposed to programmatic, which is the first one we just described. So for interactive uses, that means things like using this load all to simulate the loading of your package um, and to install uh, packages from GitHub as well. That's also called an interactive use. And just a little bit of housekeeping here. If your package does depend on DevTools or you're just sick of always having to load it every single time, then you can add it to your R profile using this. So they also talk about building R packages from source. Uh, they don't delve too much into it. They just say it's not necessary to learn now unless your code is going to be using C or C++ code. And if it does, then you're going to need some additional tools like compilers and command line tools. And they offer some instructions that are specific to your machine if you need to be doing this. All right, so different package states. I think the first one that we are most familiar with is the source state. That's, that's what you see if you go to someone's package on GitHub. You'll see a very familiar structure of a directory called R with like the different R files inside it. You'll see a description page, you'll see a license, you'll see all that stuff we're familiar with seeing. Um, there's another package state called the bundled package state. So that's just the package that's been compressed into a single file. And if you decompress it, you'll see that it looks a lot like a source package. So it has that like familiar structure, but there are differences. And the bundled state is considered platform agnostic. So it's very portable and easy to share, easier I should say. And if you want to make a bundled package, you're going to use build from DevTools. And my understanding is you need your package to be in a bundled state for current submission, right? 
Is that correct? Um, I don't remember exactly. I think that's what happens. There's a whole like process that DevTools takes you through. So um, yeah, it must happen in there. <laughs> yes, but you don't really remember or think about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the third state is the binary state. And this one, unlike the bundle state, is platform specific. And it comes in two flavors, Windows or Mac OS. It's good to distribute to our users with no package development tools. I don't know what package development tools are, so sound off if you know what those are. <laughs> um, but either way, it's not something that we have to trouble ourselves with, given that the primary maker and distributor of these binary packages is CRAN. So I think once you submit to them in a bundled form, they take it from there to make it into a binary. And that is the state in which it is uh, for people to then decompress and install it using the command that we all know because we're our users, which is install.packages. <laughs> and in memory means that it, you have loaded it and it is ready to use. Binary, I've, I've never, well, you'll use it sometimes when you're installing from CRAN, but I've never made one. I can imagine if I had a coworker who um, basically was having problems, I'd just say, okay, fine, and build the binary and give it to them, and then it just works. But um, nice. it, it's if it has like C or C++ code, you need tools on your computer in order to make that work. So if they don't have those, it won't work. But if they're not on Windows, um, they probably just have it. If they are on Windows, they just have to install our tools, and then it works. So uh, I've never had to do okay. that. OK, cool. So they provide this diagram of the package states along with some differences. Uh, they do say that this diagram has issues and will be remade in the next edition of the book. So take it with a grain of salt for now, but I think most of this should hold. And they also provide a diagram for converting between package states and how to download uh, packages in a certain state. Um, given these commands. And then they also talk about our build ignore. Uh, very happy to have read that part because now I realize I have to put a bunch of stuff in there. I had kind of ignored it. But what is build, our build ignore? It is a file in which you can put regular expressions that matches a path, a file, or even an entire directory that you want to exclude. And in a bundled package, which is again the state that you're gonna have to have your package in for CRAN submission, if you're interested in CRAN submission, is anything that's in the our build ignore uh, will not be in the final distributed package. So two options to add files to our build ignore. Again, you can use a regular expression or you can use the use this package, um, specifically use build ignore, which this is my opinion. <laughs> this is not what they said, but I think this might be, the second option might be safer. Um, whereas the first one, because it's a regular expression, uh, you might have intended for just one file to be ignored, but with that expression, anything that has the word notes in the name will be in that R build ignore. So just a word of caution with regular expressions. That's and so if you don't yeah. include the caret and the dollar sign is when that yeah. happens. The caret and the dollar sign take yeah. care of you, but it's easy to forget. Right, it's error prone yep. because it supposes <laughs> basic regular expression knowledge, which some of us do not have. Okay, including me. Uh, what to include in these R build ignores? Well, files that help you generate package contents or files that 
help you drive package development or documentation. Um, any package down stuff will also go into your R build ignore. And it's, uh, I think, well, this is kind of a note to myself here. The last <laughs> bit is uh, make sure that you are in compliance with CRAN expectations and requirements and make sure you put the right stuff in the R build ignore. And that's it for me. That's all I've got. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Um, I would say a lot of the R build ignore stuff, if you religiously use, use this, it just takes care of R build ignore. So you say, use data raw, and it'll say, oh, okay, I'll put data raw in your R build ignore. And you say, um, I don't know, like use source or something like that. There's when you were doing um, more com complex things and it just takes care of it. So, oh, or when you're like using GitHub, if you use a readme.rmd, it puts that in your R build ignore. Oh, awesome. So yeah, use this as, possibly my favorite package even though like you know there are a lot of packages that I use to actually do things but use this I use to make things to do things and as everyone knows I like building packages more than I like using packages so use this is awesome. Yeah. One thing I found interesting was like this whole paradigm of like dev tools is like wrapping or like seven other packages it's like the predecessor for like how they Tidyverse works where it's like the Tidyverse isn't really the package, but it loads all the other packages. But here it's like they're just re exporting a bunch of functions from other packages. So I wonder if they would redo that. They had, you know, it, they was, it was relatively recent that they split up DevTools. And it was funny because very soon after that, CRAN put a limit on how many packages another package can import. I don't think it was related, but I thought it was funny that as soon as the Tidy team started, like, splitting up all their packages, Cran's like, oh, you can only import, I mean, it's like 128 packages or something crazy, so it's fine, but I thought it was funny to see. <laughs> yeah. So, I have a question, please. Sure. Um, it's a dumb question, I may say, but yeah. So, um, is it only cron? Because I have seen something related like bioconductor. So, what are other possible places one can put his package in after CRAN and yeah. is it I've, CRAN the I mean which place <laughs> will uh, shall we trust package coming from um I mean CRAN packages are checked by humans but they're checked by a small number of humans so it you should trust it but not like blindly Bioconductor, I think, is harder to get into. Like, it's all in a shared GitHub thing. And so there's a stricter review, I think. But I, I've i never really dealt with Bioconductor. So I'm not sure. Um, so part of it is, like, you can mostly trust from either one. But you should do at least a little bit of due dil diligence yourself. That said, I install stuff from CRAN without really thinking about it install stuff, try it out. Like, uh, that didn't quite do what I want. Maybe I remembered to uninstall it. So I hope they do. I mean, I know they do. Um, pretty good checks of it's not hitting some random website and stealing your credentials and <laughs> whatever. So that's my thoughts. Yeah, I'd say CRAN, is, CRAN does a really good job of checking to make sure nothing, it doesn't do anything unexpected. Um, I wouldn't say that anything that goes on to CRAN is kind of like has met a certain standard in terms of like overall code quality or package quality or like ability to do the job of whatever you want it to do. Um, but it is pretty much guaranteed to be safe, um, even more so version locked and so on um, and up to date. So 
the packages that are on there, all the tests are tested frequently and still work. Um, so I would say that it's pretty safe to install. They um, also um, check uh, when a dependency changes, they let you know if it's going to break your package and they'll remove it from CRAN if it does break your package. So, yeah. yeah. So again, another question which is really related. So why some people you see that their package is only on GitHub, it's not on CRAN? I mean, why a package is not I mean, go into CRAN or by a conductor and only stay and live in GitHub. Why? Should we trust that package that lives in GitHub? Um, to a degree, those ones you have to check a lot more yourself because who knows? Like no one but you is necessarily checking it. Uh, a lot. There are a lot of reasons people don't go to CRAN. Um, I mean, a lot of packages that aren't done don't go to CRAN. And then also <laughs> there are people who have philosophical problems with CRAN and everything in between. Sometimes like, you know, uh, for example, the Tidy Tuesday R package was just on GitHub for a long time. And, he, you know, we all wanted it to be on CRAN because it's aimed at new R users. Um, and his process to install it or to, to get it accepted on CRAN was really hard because it hits a GitHub repo and like it had to work on Solaris. And we're like, but this is aimed at like brand new R users. There are zero people who use this package who are on Solaris. I, uh, okay, whatever. Um, and all these, like it had to have, uh, or he had code for if GitHub is down, what to do basically, but he couldn't properly test that. And so they were like, oh no, you can't have this. It's like, but come on, <laughs> you know? So things like that could sometimes stop people from going to CRAN. I think another um, big reason is just the, there's a lot more scrutiny. So if you do, I think it's DevTools submit, or submit to CRAN. There's some commands to submit it to CRAN and it just starts going through all this stuff. It, like, are there any typos? Is your description file filled out fully? Is, uh, so like in your description, your blurb can't mention your packet, the pa like the name of the package. It needs to like describe what it yeah. does, but not use certain words. And the title of it in that file needs to be all title case. Like there's just like all these little like checks that have to happen that you don't have to deal with when you're just making it on your own GitHub repo. So right. I, like you don't need to write any of the oxygen documentation if you don't want to, um, but it's going to be a lot more helpful for everybody if you do. Um, but CRAN's is going to require all of that. No, and it's just effort. Yeah, I would say from the other side of that though, uh, my package factory, and then I guess also I maintain a, one of the AWS packages. Both of those have benefited from submitting them to CRAN because they do actually review them. And they'll come back with, I don't understand what this package does from the description. Can you flesh this out more? And then, you know, that makes for a better package. So, so far, I haven't had any of the cases where CRAN is mean. Like, because I have seen cases where, it, you know, they're busy people. And so it can feel like they're being mean. I don't think they're actually being mean. I think they're just sometimes overlooked, overworked, which can sound a lot like mean. <laughs> um. So I hope that answered it. I mean, we went all over the place. It's if it's not on, if it, if it's on CRAN, you can probably trust it. If it's not on CRAN, depends where you heard about it. You can probably still trust it, but do your due, due diligence. I for work, I don't. None of my work packages require or depend on GitHub only packages. We find a way to make it work with CRAN packages, unless we really, 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 really have to. And then we'll like knowingly break the rule, but we have to, I, I can't think, I don't think there's anything we have right now that re relies on GitHub packages other than our own. Um, Cause you just, you never know, a GitHub package can disappear at any time. CRAN is a yeah. lot more careful if, about that. If you, if you need to, and assuming whatever licensing structure both packages have, you can just include the code of whatever mm -hmm. you need from the other package. And that so you true. don't have the exclusive dependency. 
Right. Until yeah. until they decide to post it on train. And then you can link to it. Yeah, I have done that where I need this one function from this other package. So let's see, check the license, check the license. Okay, I'm just going to copy paste that one function because then I don't have to depend on this GitHub package. Uh, I do, like, I'm hoping... I mean, not necessarily everyone, but I encourage you to try to write a package and submit it to CRAN because I think it's worth going through the process. Number one, just to know what all these people that you're, you know, whose work you're using, what they went through. Um, I think it's nice to appreciate that. And the other one is if there's a package you really like, like watch it on GitHub because then you'll get to see when they submit to CRAN and occasionally you see what they go through when they submit it to CRAN. Um, the update to the, um, which one was it? I think it was the Google Sheets package when she updated to the new API. And it she did it as a new package because it was a brand new API and she wanted to change everything in it. And this was Jenny Bryan. And it, it interacts with an API and CRAN is really, really picky when you have an API package. And it was interesting to watch someone, you know, she's literally writing the book on packages. She's co-author on the second edition of our packages. And she went, it took her multiple weeks to get that package accepted on CRAN. And I, it was really interesting to watch that happen on GitHub. So I, I definitely recommend that. If there's something you like, uh, click that watch button on GitHub and you can see all the craziness that they go through. Is there a lot of uh, passive aggressive Comments how to get connected messages. On certain things, there are. Uh, when it's, you know, it, it like I say, it's, the CRAN team is a small team, so sometimes it seems like they're mean, but I really don't think they're mean. I think they're just overworked. Who? Did it ever happen that they turned down a package just because they don't think it's interesting enough? Like you've done. You jump through all the hoops, you've done everything you need, they just say, actually, no, we don't care about this, it's boring or esoteric. Supposedly. I, I can't think of an example, but they say if it isn't, like, there is something in the, like, rules for CRAN about it, you know, it has to be novel or something like that, um, and they'll have one where, basically, they're encouraging the, the author to merge it into a package that does more, is what I've seen before. Um, and that is that it, you know, that's going back to the DevTools split. There are arguments both ways of do a package that does one thing and does it really well is nice because then it's easier to import that one thing into another package. Hmm. Um, but if, you know, if there are right now, there are like 15,000 packages on CRAN, 14,000, something like that. It's already at the point where there's no way to know everything that's on CRAN and they don't want it to get to 50,000 or 100,000 where there's really no way to know. Or they need a better search. I mean, because I, I don't know. I, I like the, the little micro packages that do one thing and do it really well. Um, but I can see the argument. I was making, I made a package that is for colors and some someone warned me that Cran's been kind of picky about packages around colors lately. Mm. There's too many palette building <laughs> our packages out there. Luckily, mine does like something a little different, but uh, I didn't have any trouble. But someone was like, eh, you might be careful. They might deny it. That is something I've been trying to be better at more and more is um, the idea of, you know, really see if someone already is doing something at least close. And most of these are open source. So just go make that better. Because then actually that's, why I maintain one of the AWS packages now is I was about to make my own package because it wasn't on CRAN anymore. And I was like, oh, look, on GitHub, they're looking for a new maintainer. I'll just start from their package. And then even if I do end up totally changing it, it's there aren't two doing the same. Well, actually, there are two doing the same thing. But there aren't three doing the same thing <laughs> at that point. I, I think I've done the inverse. I've said, I have this great name, which <laughs> Does anyone have it? No. Okay, I'm going to run with that. There's that too. Usually, it's hard to get a great like to come up with a great name. That's that's always the hard part. <laughs> I've got some some pun math on my team. 
Yeah. Well, Tyler, was, Tyler was the genius with all the, the nice package names. <laughs> I, went, I went creeping on your, your, uh, your GitHub. Colonoscopy. So good. <laughs> That none submitted though. <laughs> See, my problem, my problem is that you know I think when you put something on crayon, there's some expectation that you're going to maintain it, and a lot of times I kind of do just enough to get what I need done, and then I have some grand idea that it'd be awesome if I could turn it into a full blown published package, but in the end, it's like I now I'm moving on to something else, and maybe eventually I'll get back to it, but. Putting on crayon would kind of give me a sense of expectation to to maintain for what it's worth. The the maintaining part is really is yeah what I've read a lot of people saying like they just I mean that's why John you have to pick up the package right like someone <laughs> has their responsibilities so maintaining it is definitely well. Yes, but uh, it was one guy maintaining like all of these packages for interacting with Amazon Web Services, and now there are five of us, I think. Um, and so that was part of it, like because he had to be on top of every API that Amazon publishes, and oh no, this one thing changed. So I've got all these packages, and he just couldn't deal with it. Plus, he started working at where is he facebook i think and i'll bet uh there was conflict of interest issues there of giant web company versus other giant web company so it's a thing <laughs> yeah so um as john made mention um the Crown team is so small. So I was thinking before, like if someone submits a package, the way it is reviewed is some is similar to the way scientific articles are reviewed in the sense that if I submit a package related to natural language processing, NLP or computer vision or related to that, then they can give to someone who is expert in that field so that he can review it and test it and stuff like that so yeah. from all, so so from all the way john you're saying it looks not the way it is i mean it isn't are, that yet uh, i would not be surprised if eventually it moves in that direction um right now i mean first they do automated checks and i think a lot of packages just get kicked out at that point um but they do um, like have a set of things that they go through and, and personally review a human reviewing it and right now it is just a certain set of humans reviewing it um, it will be interesting I think it is possibly reaching a point where they might have to rethink the general structure of how they do things um, and who knows what that'll mean Uh, I thought the, the question was kind of about like, do they have like actual subject matter experts and like actually review it? I think it's just any anyone that's available, right? Yeah, it's the it's a really small team, and uh, they personally, you know, it's I think it's basically whoever's up next or uh, whoever. It might have some slight subject matter expert level in there i don't know how they decide who's going to review it but it's not it's not expert expert you know it's more oh i'm interested in this family of packages so i'll review that i think i don't know i don't know how they yeah, it, like they, i mean they don't they don't do any verification that you know let's say you're implementing some numerical algorithm they're not, they're not checking that you did it correctly they're just right that's checking true. that you don't cause anything to crash or and that, things you shouldn't. that the description makes sense uh, that, that they can grasp what it is that you're doing um, yeah. but yeah that's true they don't really check the package per se you can certainly publish about your package and that would be the true. one of the good ways to get validation 
Yes. Um, the Tidy team's been doing that more and more, and they put out like the Tidyverse paper so you can cite the Tidyverse properly. Um, I That isn't a thing that I had ever like considered in any of the stuff I do, but I think that'd be cool. Um, might have to do that at some point. I'm trying to look. There is a list on Crayon somewhere. Uh, but I don't remember where of who who makes up Cran. Is it is it a job you can apply to, or <laughs> the powers that make <laughs> this nominee? It's. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Is it our? Uh, it's our core related. Um. And I'm trying to find it because I can't remember who's on it. And that's actually, that's one of the funny like side things is by taking up this AWS package, there were a lot of people who were upset when the AWS packages got moved off of CRAN. So one of my co-maintainers is like a member of our core. And it was interesting to be like, wait a minute, I know your name. <laughs> that's, that's familiar. What do you do? Oh God. Okay. <laughs> like... Uh, president of the Art Foundation or whatever he is right now. So, yeah. I think it's some element of this list here. I know Ripley is famous for being one. <laughs> There's also, like, I was dealing last with like ue lidges lidges yeah like and i know simon urbanic is another one who reviews packages sometimes beyond that i don't really know who else does yeah i don't know it's uh there are people who could answer this question i am not one of them but i know there is a set list of people who are cran like they're they're the people who do it which is still it's a little a little crazy like you know, for August, Cran was closed for a couple weeks because uh, they're like, "Hey, we're we're taking some time off because we are like five people or whatever it is." And it's like, ah, that's not entirely sustainable, but it's worked so far. Yeah, like the other languages kind of have some. I think R is probably more strict than most languages with like publishing to some kind of central repository. Uh, I don't know what you would consider CRAN. Um, like there's PyPy for Python, but I think Go and stuff for JavaScript. Uh, Ruby has some version of it. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know. Like it's just kind of interesting to see the different ways it's handled in other languages. I have a couple famous statisticians on the list, so maybe they play a part in reviewing the stats packages or maintaining them. I mean, it is true um, that it isn't like they really review them. They they look at it and make yeah. sure it doesn't, yeah. you know, they have some automated checks to make sure it's not breaking anything. They look at the description and the title and some certain things, you know, just making sure it makes sense. And they do, um, I don't know, kind of look through the structure of the code, but not what it does. Like, I don't think it makes a big difference. I don't think they need, they go through and kind of parse the code and make sure the code makes sense. They just make sure that your examples make sense or, and that, um, you know, you don't have any of these certain things that caught, set off flags for them and that sort of thing. I wonder what languages like SAS, what their process is like, because that's that was at least a common thing that people would say is, oh, I we trust statistical analysis done in SAS more so than R because R is open yeah. source. That's like science is open source, 
you know, like the concept of science. So <laughs> if you trust closed source more than open source, you trust, I don't know, alchemy more than science. So that's, I mean, that's my very opinionated view on this, but. There's, source, there's probably some, some belief that if you're paying for it, that yeah, there better that. be right. There's nobody's going to pay for it if they find out it doesn't work. <laughs> There's like lack of culpability, like if something's wrong, you can blame the, the software. No, it wasn't me, it was them, yeah. So, there is that. Because I, I bet if, if, well, I don't know, I don't know anything about SAS, but I bet it's it's kind of a similar setup. You have a group of people that review code and decide it's good enough. wonder if they have like an extra layer um, beyond that, but now, now the norm really is if you have a package that does interesting things, you just get it published. So I find that to be more validating than something that's kind of closed and we don't really know how it gets validated. Yeah. And it's like just all like internal developers writing those packages, I guess, or add-ons. Right. right. Not familiar with SAS at all. Sorry, <laughs> it is a, not a uh, you're better for that. <laughs> if you want to make money, become a SAS programmer because I've seen some job ads paying like well into the six figures for that. I, I talked to someone that worked at SAS and he said he hated it. He left some word and told me that he, he was like I don't know in his mid twenties. He was like yeah, everyone here is like over forty. <laughs> Not to be ages or anything, but that's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting to see that. Uh, I mean, I'm a bit, a bit surprised that Hadley doesn't mix to the R core team. <laughs> I don't yeah. think he wanted to. Yeah, like uh, I think that's the thing is he's he's off working on other things. They, like I know, um, uh, what Thomas Lynn Peterson has done things in the core R graphics engine because he started working on ggplot too and was like, oh, this is broken in core. Um, let's fix that. And so there has been, I think, more cross pollination between Tidyverse team and R core recently. Um, I don't get the feeling that the like war that's supposed to be there is really there. Like, I think everybody gets along. Um, th there are, you know, like the Tidyverse team is not our core and they're, they're different people, but I don't think that there's enmity between them. You just have different objectives, right? Like a Tidyverse team, like the Tidyverse is an opinionated framework. So by nature, it's going to be like different than our core, which is, you know, to maintain stability in the language and make sure you know, yeah, it's stable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think Hadley was kind of talking about this recently. I thought I thought it was in our talk or in the talk when he was talking to us, but he was saying something like the tidyverse is growing so much that he has to slow down how quickly he can accept new features and add new functionality to things, um, which is an interesting thought because packages have always been the way that you can introduce a lot more forward thinking stuff and our base or core is kind of like everything that they do, all of the code is backwards compatible pretty much all the time. Like right. anything like that is always backwards compatible. And then packages give you the freedom to just go forward, break it, apologize to the people you broke like stuff on and just keep going forward, right? So it's an interesting like thing to hear him say, well, Tidyverse is kind of growing so much that it's almost need to be treated like the language and not like um, well, it, a package. It depend, depends on the piece of the Tidyverse because like TidyR and DeepLyR just hit, uh, well, just, it's been a while now, but relatively recently each hit 1.0. Um, and they are treating it like, okay, it's 1.0 now, that's different. Now it's a real package, which cracks me up because like, yeah, your packages are used in thousands and thousands and thousands of analyses, but 
now it's a real package. (laughs) But yeah. I I think that versioning is actually worse in Python than I like. You'll see like super long version numbers and it's still below 1.0. Well, yeah, but Python is zero indexed. So. (laughs) 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 Smooth. Love it. 